Hey guys, it's Chris again. Just want to uh, send this video off to you to give you instructions on the next part of uh, your assignments, next section of uh, coursework that I want you to study through. Uh, also to just kind of give you some feedback based on your responses. Thank you for sending those. Uh, Maya, I actually didn't get yours. Um, I know you made one, but you, I think what you did when you uploaded the video is you made it private instead of public. And so um, if you could go and make that uh, a public, uh, a public uh, video for me, I'll, I think all you have to do is go back on your, your video and switch it from private to public. I'll be able to watch it. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just jump in real quick and describe that. Key to understanding these passages that have been used for uh, centuries, really, uh, to justify and even promote things like segregation and slavery that are definitely going to play a, a factor later on when we get to the civil rights movement in America is the fact that um, they are taken uh, greatly out of context. And so uh, when you read an ancient document like the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, you have to understand that that is uh, a document that goes back 3,200 years at least and has traditions that probably go back up to a thousand years before it. So we're talking ancient standards and ancient documents. And one of the keys when you look at history is you cannot judge history um, by modern uh, morality to, to try to make it sense in the complex realities of like an ancient society, right? Like you, you have to be able to step into the shoes of the society and the people of the time. So what you're going to find with much of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is something called like a progressive revelation. So God, if you read the stories from Genesis onward to, to the time of the New Testament, you'll notice that God, when he reveals himself and his purposes to his people, it, it's not like all the details and all the information all at once. Look at the story of Abraham. It's, it's a key story. God doesn't come and tell him that all the idols that his parents have been worshiping are false. Doesn't give him the whole history of how his ancestors are going to play out. Uh, doesn't give him the Torah. Doesn't give him the law. Uh, doesn't really talk that much about a Messiah. And even if you make that argument, I, I think it's a weak one. Like he just says, uh, like, go. Like, go to a land that I will show you. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. I will make you a father of many nations. Even in Abraham's life, from the point when he's called at 75 to the point when he dies uh, past 100, he is learning more about this relationship with Yahweh, with God. He is learning more about what his call is. But when he dies, he, he, does, he has like 1% of the information that later people in the Bible will have. God is revealing himself in stages. And the reason he does that is because... He is giving them enough information to activate their faith uh, in ways that they, can, uh, that they can step out and pass it on to the next generation. We know that the purpose of the Jewish people was to be priests of the world, for the world, uh, to essentially represent Yahweh to the rest of the world that looked at the gods in very different ways. And uh, the church has kind of taken on that mantle. We're the new Israel. We've been grafted into the vine. And so... And so we have that same kind of continuation of mission and message. So like when you read the Bible and you read the Old Testament, you have to understand that um, they're dealing with limited understanding. And God also does this throughout the story. He enters into the world as it is, not necessarily the world that he is looking to redeem it to. So in ancient Israel, as in ancient uh, Persia or Egypt or Greece, Every civilization throughout history, slavery was a reality, just was a reality. And so um, as much as we may recognize in our enlightened state today how terrible that is, you have to really be fair to the ancients. It would have been as common as anything. They didn't have banks. They, did, they didn't have any other way of getting themselves out of financial troubles. Slavery was the means by which if you could not afford something, you sold yourself or your children into slavery for a period of time until uh, that time came when you could buy them back. If you were conquered by a foreign nation, you were likely going into slavery if you weren't killed. This just was the way things were. And so what you'll find is, uh, what the Bible shows us in the Torah 
is those laws that disturb us are actually revolutionary for their time. They actually put restrictions on what people could do to their slaves. So for instance, when we read about something like that they had to be treated fairly, they had to be, uh, they, they couldn't um, execute any sort of uh, capital punishment or physical harm on them past a certain point. Um, when we look at uh, texts that describe uh, that the slave owners, slave owners could be tried and found guilty if they abuse their slaves. No society has ever done something like that. Here are two that are really huge. Um, Seven-year limits for slaves. Seven-year limits. You know, slavery was usually something that was like it was a lifetime commitment or till you could buy someone back. And the Bible puts on limitations on how long you can actually sell yourself into indentured servitude. Um, also, we read passages like um, where a man might marry his slave. Uh, and we read that as just horrendous by modern standards. But the text goes on to describe that if a man does a, um, marry a slave and the slave agrees to it, the man is required to treat her like a spouse, not like property anymore. And um, in the ancient world, uh, the way the mindset of people, especially females who did not have either a father or a husband, was that their sole objective in life was to care for the home. And that also meant um, reproduction. So to have the covering of a husband um, was enormous. The fact that it explicitly states that as law in the Torah is beyond revolutionary for its time. And so it is hard for us to read this in the 21st century. I get it. Uh, but you have to be fair to the history of the time and the context of the people. And also recognize there was not a society that did not have slavery. So those passages, I actually would encourage you uh, to look at them. Uh, when you read a passage in the Bible that might stick with you the wrong way, do a little homework behind the verse especially in the, in the Torah or the Pentateuch. Do a little bit of history behind it. That way you won't get junked up in the wrong ways. Okay, one of the assignments I had you look at was Genesis 9. It was the curse of Ham. And uh, so, yeah, I know you brought this up that uh, that was a confusing passage. And it has confused people for a long time. Uh, ancient rabbis actually uh, didn't exactly know what to do with this verse. So there is many different theories as to what this text could be talking about. Like literally, I've read dozens of them. But there are a couple that are very popular and actually uh, were brought up hundreds and hundreds of years ago, not even in Christian circles, in Jewish circles. And that is that um, what we're reading in the story has a lot of euphemisms behind it, a lot of um, kind of symbolism. So... When Ham sees his father naked, so we know the story, Noah, his sons, they get off the ark. Um, you know, Noah starts planting, he gets a vineyard, he discovers wine, he gets drunk, he passes out. Uh, Ham goes and he sees his father's nakedness. The Bible says that it saw his father's nakedness. Uh, in the Bible, sometimes it, words will be that we look at that describe an action. Uh, we'll have another symbol behind it. And so, for instance, um, in the Bible, the word saw, see, to know is often connected to a sexual act. So um, let me just give you a little context here. Um, for instance, in Leviticus uh, 2017, it says this, If a man has sexual intercourse with his sister, whether the daughter of his father and his mother, so that, watch this, he sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, sees nakedness here is actually a connection uh, to a sexual act. Um, when uh, in the story of Lot with his two daughters, after they flee out of um, Sodom and they go and hide in the cave and the uh, two daughters think the end of the world has happened. Who will, who will repopulate the earth if not us? Well, we don't have any, anyone here. The only man here is our father. So they get him drunk and each of them have sex with him, uh, the Bible's pretty graphic, and they get pregnant so that they can continue on their line. But the word it says here in Genesis 19.35 of this story is, uh, um, and he did not know, know, 
when she lay down or when she arose. And so, um, you know, this is this is one of those stories like Noah awoke, Genesis 9, 24. Noah awoke from his drunken stupor and knew what his youngest son had done to him. So both in this story, we're seeing like that Ham sees his father nakedness and that Noah knew um, what had been done. And so, uh, you know, in this story, like there's there's a couple theories here is that what happened here in this story is that Noah um, was actually raped by his uh, youngest son, Ham, or and this is another popular one that while his father was drunk and passed out, he raped his mother, and that Canaan is the offspring of Ham and the incestuous offspring of his of Ham and his mother. Uh, that's not named, I think, in the in the text. And so the son that's born from Noah's wife and his son is Canaan, and the reason he's cursed is because of this. So right there when you know that this story has loaded analogies with it and a bunch of different theories, and I want to make sure you hear this, That's th these are biblical theories. No one clearly knows uh, the point of this story. But um, when you know these kind of loaded analogies, um, all of a sudden the te text takes on a different meaning. It doesn't endorse something like segregation or slavery as uh, later commentators would make it do. And so um, knowledge of, of the background of the text is critical. Whenever you see something that looks hard, there's usually good reasons for explaining it uh, behind it. Um, w with this progressive revelation that we're talking about, if you keep going on, you'll see in the Bible more and more. You'll see that as it gets to the Torah, as it gets to the kingdom period, as it gets to the later prophets, there will be an evolution in the thinking of things like slavery. You'll get to points where, like in the prophets, um, there will be almost contradictions to what the Torah said. It's not that it's disagreeing necessarily with the Bible. It's that God's fuller revelation is coming into actuality. And so they're able to see new realities of God's purpose, especially in Israel that came out of 400 years of slavery themselves. They know that story. And um, constantly in the Bible, you will hear when there's a justice issue, God tells his people to look out for three groups, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. Foreigners are usually slaves. You get to the New Testament, and this is radical. The fact that slaves were invited to the table, right? Invited to the church, to communion, to the table, the same table as brothers and sisters. There is no doubt that there were some house churches that had slave owners and slaves. And all of a sudden, around the table, they're brothers and sisters. The book of Philemon, um, is absolutely radical for its time. Um, the first bishop of Rome is Clement, actually the second bishop, if you count Peter. Uh, he's Clement. He wrote a book called First and Second Clement, historical books. Almost certainly was a slave. Uh, this is like, like the second pope was a slave. So, so um, all of a sudden, there is this evolution happening. One, one quick thing. Uh, so you mentioned something about Nehemiah and how that set you wrong. Uh, the book of Ruth was actually written at the same time frame as Ezra and Nehemiah were written. And uh, very interesting that on one hand, you have a book that says in Nehemiah, um, you know, men, uh, you need to divorce your wives who are foreigners because they're bad. They're bad influences. Uh, Nehemiah is looking at the history of what got Israel in trouble and captured and conquered by Babylon and sent off into exile. It was that they were uh, corrupted by the nations around them. And so to make sure that never happened again, he starts to build rules around the rules, a law around the law. And you'll see this play out later in the New Testament. That the, that the later Pharisees will take it one step further. So when Jesus is counteracting some of the laws, you've heard it said this, but I say this to you, he's not actually negating scripture. He's negating the laws that the Pharisees built around the laws 
to make sure people never get close to it. So Nehemiah is like an early example of this happening. It's funny that someone took the history of David's family at the same time and wrote the book of Ruth. And if you know the story of Ruth, you know that Ruth was a Moabite. She was a foreigner. She's the hero of the story. But more than that, she is the great-grandmother of King David, the greatest king in Israel. So the monarchy in Israel has its roots to someone who's Jewish and Moabite. So right there, it's, it's, it's kind of showing like things aren't necessarily as clear as they seem. So um, really interesting stuff. Uh, fall in love with the Bible. It's great. Uh, the next amount of material you're going to look through is getting into the slave trade. So before we get into the civil rights movement, you got to get into the slave trade. So there's a bunch of videos for you to watch through here. I, I attached a few photographs with some quotes on there. Those quotes are from some of the earliest American leaders. So we're going to fast forward really quickly, get into the slave trade. We got to see the horror of what the slave trade looked like. Uh, we got to see how slavery um, uh, actually uh, came into uh, into being in the Americas, like what they actually did. Uh, there was a time when it was starting to not look that profitable, and then someone invented something called the cotton gin. So this is why there's a lot of slaves in the South where there's a lot of cotton. Uh, we'll explain a little bit more about that. But there's also another assignment there for you to do, and it looks at some of the formative documents of uh, the United States of America, like the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. And what I want you to do in those, uh, as you read those, you can find them online anywhere, but look and see how they're ahead of their time, like, like the idealism that still people champion today. But also look how they failed um, to live up to their standards, particularly through the lens of what would be the American slave trade, okay? Keep working hard, you guys. I'll talk to you soon.